So sometimes the muting and unmuting can be quite unmanageable. So, all right, so why some projects fail and why will others succeed? So, and if you could just, uh, this is the subjective questions and you can kind of type in the boxes that will help us to maybe get to some sense of uh, what we want to do for today. So why some projects fail while others succeed? So, and to get this going, maybe I can mention a few things and you, you see whether you agree or not. Uh, do you believe that projects fail because of lack of resources? Uh, lack of resources fail. Resources are lack of time, lack of money, lack of people, lack of equipment. Uh, if you think that that's true, uh, you can actually agree or disagree with that, no problem. Jeremy said pro management. <laughs> um, okay, fair enough. So what we want to do is that if you could, maybe I will start with this. If you have, if your lack of time, lack of resources, can a project be successful? So that's the first key question that we wanted to ask. And in fact, uh, today I, I've just finished a session, the full day session on project management. I've, I've done training or webinar for today and uh, finished that training already. So this is another kind of a webinar, but this is basically to do a preview. And if you could just look at the history of uh, maybe I can use Singapore as an example. Uh, as you know, Singapore started with almost nothing, right? And of course, from nothing to something. Uh, so it, the idea of project management is very, very interesting. And the good news is that if you're comfortable in project management, you're probably comfortable in many other spheres of life as well and activities as, as well. So I, I would tend to agree with Jeremy. Uh, a lot of times, managing project is about uh, two things two sets of uh, variables, I would say. The first set is about the technicalities of the project in itself. Um, and the second set is about the managing of the project in itself. Okay, so that's the introduction, something for us to ponder. And if you look at countries, if you start with countries first, right, with resources and everything. So not uh, all the countries with resources are successful. And if you're familiar with the name Anthony Robbins, I could just mention his name. And he said one thing quite interesting. Uh, he said that we are never out of resources. We are just being not resourceful enough. So that's an interesting thought that we like to, to carry along. So poor management is actually one of them. And, and to carry us, for, carry us further, we want to maybe give you a bit of uh, introduction and management first and then a project management first, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. So let's talk about a quick definition. A project consists of three things. Uh, let me just admit someone first. Okay, the basically consists of three things. The first thing is that a project would actually have this non-routine tasks as in a part of the project element. Uh, if you're doing routine tasks, uh, if your job is routine, uh, especially if your job doesn't have a start and stop, you know, doesn't have a start, doesn't have a stop or ending, then it is not project anymore. So two points, non-routine, start and stop, start and finish dates. But the last point is the most relevant in my opinion, a project has resource constraints, okay? So you either don't have enough time or money or budget, or you don't have enough people, or even equipment, uh, and you may not have enough skilled people to actually help you to run the projects. So those are the criteria of what we call project in itself. So now uh, I have something interesting, you know, if you have everything, you have time, you have money, you don't have any problem in people, equipment, you have sufficient, all the resources are great. Uh, we do not call that project anymore. So a quiz. What do we call that if you have everything? Time, money, people, equipment. No longer project. What do you call that? Let me just type that in. So if I could just, uh, don't mind, yeah? We call that a dream, ladies and gentlemen. If you have everything, we call that a dream. But putting the word dream aside, and what is the challenge? Right? If you have everything, then the challenge is this we cannot apply project management. We can't even manage. 
And the reason we can't manage is that you can't even think how to manage because you have, you know, almost infinite time and resources and you know what not. So that's the, the introductory part about uh, project in itself. Now comes the exciting part in my opinion. The exciting part is the second word, all right, project and then management. So what is the, the meaning of that if we combine those two together? Uh, our meaning is that the first thing that you got to do is you got to see whether you should or you should not even start the project. That's the first point when we talk about project management. Um, there are certain projects you are doomed for failure. If you start it, you're not going to make it. So I will just call that Tom Cruise project. Okay. So all of you are familiar with Tom Cruise, the famous uh, series of movies, what do you call them? It's actually Mission Impossible, right? So if you have Mission Impossible, it's too bad. Now that's the first point. The second point about managing is that if you think that the project is not impossible, it's doable. Then the next thing is we want to make sure that we take care of all the, if I may use the word, ladies and gentlemen, take care of all the excuses. So the project is not easy, but it's not impossible. And therefore we like to manage the project so that we become successful. So no more excuses. And we like to, you know, package it in such a way that for today's preview, a couple of tools and techniques and ideas maybe to kind of bounce around for us to think about. All right, so, and if you could just pop it in your chat box, uh, if we talk about projects, the starting point for project is testing. So the step one, we highly, highly recommend. We like to start off with a sound footing. What do we want to achieve? So our recommendations are just three things here. The first thing is about project statement. Second is the objective. And the third is the duration of the project. And the statement doesn't have to be like a, a, a long essay, you know, it's short sentence or a few words would do, a project statement uh, to clarify what you want to achieve. That will be followed by an objective and the duration. So an example for a project statement is, I want to improve productivity. Because you can extend it a little bit, I want to improve productivity in my department. Uh, I want to improve productivity in, in my company or organization. So that's just one thing. And of course you can add in a, a few points as well, improving productivity. Uh, you can add things like improving labor productivity, uh, improving efficiency in my department or in my companies, etc. And that would need to be followed by an objective, something that is actually quantifiable. And uh, for example, uh, uh, improvement or savings of about two hours in terms of productivity. So maybe last time uh, when we wanted to do something, uh, it would maybe take us seven hours, six hours. So we want to save two hours from here. So that's an example of improving uh, productivity. And of course, the last point about the first step is about this thing, duration. So it can be three months, four months, 10 weeks, doesn't matter. So there's a time element to that. So a lot of these are very straightforward. It's not that complicated. The tricky part is the, you know, the objective portion. So my role here is to get a bit of interaction, uh, maybe to discuss with you, or you can bounce some question. Uh, is there any other item that you think is non-quantifiable? Let me know. So if you're, if you're stuck, if you're not sure, maybe you, you know, out of your own initiative, or your customers or your boss may actually ask you to do a project, and uh, if, you, if you're stuck, if you're not sure whether the projects that you're doing, uh, you're not sure whether it is quantifiable or not. Uh, in this case, we, we, we talk about this objective. Uh, so if you have those kind of questions, it'd be very helpful. You can raise it up. I can actually help you. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable in quantification. So, so if not, what I'd like to do is I'll throw you a question, if you don't mind. So if your project is this, let me just see someone. Okay, so, 
So ladies and gentlemen, I just typed something on the screen. Uh, assuming your, your, the name or the title of your project is to improve the morale in the workplace. So maybe you're from human resource department. So you're being tasked to improve a project, in this case, improving morale. And maybe your boss is giving you, uh, so three months to do it. Okay. And that leaves us the quantification. So how do you quantify that? How do you put an objective? Because our definition of objective is that it's got to have some kind of a numbers so that we can actually anchor our thoughts, focus our attention towards managing this project. So um, for those of you, if you, you want to try, you put it in a chat box, so there's a bit of interaction as well. And uh, how do you quantify the word improving morale? So anybody want us to try? So you can type something on the screen, that would be fantastic. Um, so it, it, it seems like it's actually quite something that is actually very challenging because the word morale has uh, something very, very different. Thank you so much. Use uh, survey, very good. Use survey, obtain baseline, get before and after. Colleen, thank you very much. This whole staff turnover, resume absenteeism, engagement score, fantastic. You, you guys are experts, so that's good. Yeah, uh, things like morale, you can actually measure, you know, in terms of absenteeism and uh, staff turnover. You know, of course, you can actually measure uh, in addition to absenteeism. One of my favorite is medical leave. Okay, so and uh, medical leave is a is an sick leave. That's right. Thank you, Sihun. And uh, do you have people in your organizations? who got very, very confused between annual leave and medical leave. Um, so and when I say that, you know, <laughs> some people, they think that medical leave is, the, is equivalent to annual leave. So got to clear all, right? <laughs> so thank you. So yeah, so that's, that's the thing about quantification. So now, thank you so much, both our entitlement, uh, Rebecca. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, uh, Rebecca, if you're from HR or whatever, uh, entitlement, annual leave is an entitlement. Uh, and of course, uh, it, it got, they got very confused, that's right. Okay, so interesting. So what we want to do is that to answer the question, um, it's not a difficult question to answer. And the question is this, why quantify? So why do we have to quantify projects, okay? When you start a project, uh, okay, you have the title and then you have the timeline. Why do we need to even care to actually put in the objectives? In this case, the quantifications, the measurability. So we quantify to measure. Why? So a few points to share here. Uh, just take this red dots away. All right. So a few points to, to share. We start well with this uh, solid footing, as I've said. So the first point is this, why quantify? Uh, we want to be able to measure, okay? Now, if, you, if you're ever going to go back to your customers or your bosses or whoever that says, hey, I've got this project done, is uh, very successful, we have achieved something, and that you can show something that you have actually achieved. So that's the measurability. Okay, to be able to present the project deliverables, that's right. If you can't measure, you can't manage. Correct, Colleen, that's good. Sihun, thank you. Um, the other thing is also helps you to determine resources. Um, if you have a quantified version, so we'll come back to just now, yeah? If I can flip the screen a little bit, if you don't mind. Okay, so if you're to manage, look in the screen here, and if your boss or anybody asks you, Okay, you want to do a productivity improvement project, that's fine. How many people do you need? How much time, how much budget do you need? If you do, you need, need, need any budget, right? How much do you need? And if you say, uh, I, I need, I need $5,000, I, I need five people. So my quick question to you is that $5,000 and five people to do this project for nine months to save two hours, should we do it? So, so I'm actually using this to anchor our thoughts, right? Saving two hours, but we need five person and $5,000 to do this project. So we're attempting to answer this question. Do we have 
too many resources or too much of it, or we don't have enough. Okay. And therefore, the quantification part will be very, very helpful. Uh, the trick is, if you look at the point about, you know, improving two hours, quantify productivity, are you improving two hours every single day? Or you improve two hours per week? Or are you going to improve two hours per month? Uh, that sort of things. And then you can actually benchmark against the resources in itself. So I, uh, I think someone is drawing on the screen here. Um, maybe I'll just erase it. If you just help me a bit, uh, that would be fantastic. Okay. So, yeah. So the, the, the second point about this is about determination, determination of resources. And of course, the third point is should we go ahead or not? Uh, I know it's a bit challenging, especially if the person who is giving you the assignment uh, or doing this project, then uh, it's difficult you know, to go against your boss, right? If your boss is saying, you do it. <laughs> so it's kind of difficult to, uh, yeah, to tell your boss, no, no, I, I don't want to do it, right? But from the managing point of view, uh, this is a healthy habit to, to, to think about. Are we able to go ahead or not? And later, I want to inject another input to assist you. And that input is, are you able to influence your boss? Now, I, in no way I'm actually insulting your, the, your capability and in no way I'm actually insulting your boss as well. So, how many of you say, yes, I can influence my boss? Please type one. Uh, influence here, uh, what I mean by that is that influence to, to tell, no, we should not go ahead with the project and your boss will listen to you. So, or I, I want more money, more budget, more people for the project and the boss will listen to you. If you can influence your boss, please type one. Or you believe it's possible to influence your boss, please type one. Okay, BC, thank you. All right, yep, Xiongwen, yes. Uh, Jeremy, yes, thank you. And uh, Sihun, fantastic. Um, and this is good news. People can be influenced. Uh, later, we will be talking about that. Uh, how do we do that? There's a, there's a small section on that. But you need justification, that's right. Okay. And uh, so that's from Candy. So, have you met bosses, uh, despite all the justification, uh, all the data that you show, uh, still say no? Uh? <laughs> so later on, we will talk about that because some people are rational and some people are not. Okay. And, uh, the other part about this quantification is about prioritization of projects. So let me give you two examples. And uh, so maybe I'll just type something on the screen here for us to, to work on. So I'll give you two projects now. And then I mean, maybe I'll just type that in. Um, say customer complaint. Versus staff turn over rate. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just put this as a matter of project. High customer complaint and uh, high staff turnover. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when you compare these two, my apology. How many of you? would say that, uh, you know, which project should you do first? Customer complaint versus staff turnover. Which one is actually more serious? And the truth is, I don't think you have the answer unless we do a quantification. So unless we quantify the thing. And therefore, it answers the, the, this portion about the prioritization of projects. Okay, so uh, if you have a high customer complaint leading to, for instance, loss of uh, sales, and obviously you quantify that as high staff turnover, and we're trying to match it with the uh, uh, sales or revenue drop, then you're able to be in a position to prioritize projects. And so that's the introduction for us to talk about all that. Okay, and uh, so. So next, I would like to do after step one, uh, remember step one is about naming your project, quantifying the project, 
and determine the length the, or the duration of the project. So once you do that, we're gonna go into step two. And before we get into step two, uh, how many of you, you uh, I'm just kind of give you some, some background story. This uh, is the disaster and impacting BP, the oil company. And, and the impact is at the moment, it's uh, counting, uh, the cost is about 40 billion and counting. Partly compensation, insurance, uh, fines by the governments and so on and so forth. And they have uh, a very unenviable record, uh, the world record of uh, spillage of uh, this disaster contamination. So now, uh, how it actually turned into a movie a few years ago, Deep Horizon, right? Now, I wanted you to comment this. How many of you think that this is a surprise? If you think it's a surprise, please type yes. Yeah, you just type why, if you think it's a surprise. Uh, so yes, it's a surprise, or N is not a surprise. So if you could just help me to do that. Okay, thank you, Sarah. It's a surprise, thank you. Uh, that it, it, it kind of explode exploded and then causing the you know the death uh, 11 people died unfortunately so can this go yes surprise jeremy thank you yes it's a surprise fantastic uh, so keep the thing going as we as we chat along um, so i'm actually here to work with you ladies and gentlemen uh, this incident and later i want to impress upon you many many incidents they shouldn't be a surprise from the managing part of the project in itself or managing anything. So what I'm going to share with you is not only you are, it's actually applicable in project management, you can actually apply that in leadership, marketing, risk management, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, thank you for your answers. So this is not disputing your answers, yeah. And I would like to look, uh, get you to look at the screen here, 829 and 33. So, and so maybe I'll just uh, type something here. Okay. Uh, this small, small letter will do. You know, you, you have all these oil company, you know, uh, ExxonMobil and uh, many others as well. And they, they are operating at the southern coast of the uh, United States, uh, mainly near Louisiana, right? The Gulf of Mexico. Louisiana. So there are lots of lots of oil company operating there. You have Shell, Exxon, and, and many, many others. And uh, so a lot of this uh, is very typical. Governments of the world, in fact, almost all governments of the world, if you're doing oil exploration, they would actually have to do, you know, this thing called safety audit. So as a result of audit, you have what we call the famous phrase, yeah, non-conformances or non-compliances. Uh, lack of uh, safety awareness and whatnot. So, and Shell, Exxon, uh, Total, many, many, many other different companies, the total non-compliance as a result of the safety audit from the US Safety Department, the total non-compliances is the eight, uh, sorry, 33 cases, 33 cases. And uh, sorry, there's no price for Correct answer, yeah. BP alone, 829 cases. BP alone, 829 non-compliance to the safety standard. And therefore, once you look at the numbers, which is also part of the quantification, right? Then you would actually conclude that this is not a surprise. It is a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. So this is... Just one example of not surprises. Now, of course, what we would like to work with you uh, as a matter of looking through this is, you know, things like BP and everything. So I want to challenge you, can adverse events in general, can they be anticipated? Uh, negative adverse events, not their timing, uh, by the way, timing is like, you know, you, you know exactly that 5.45 p.m. and 23 seconds is going to happen. So we're not talking about the timing. We're just talking about the events in itself. Uh, how many of you think that events can be anticipated? If you think that negative events, big or small, can be anticipated, please type one. 
Sorry. Jeremy, thank you. Yeah, if you can anticipate, Gordon, Rebecca, thank you so much. Yeah, you can anticipate. So, and therefore, things like this BP case and many, many other cases as well can be anticipated. And the trick is, do we have a framework or a structure to assist us? And the good news is that we do have, but I just want to be careful, yeah, folks, I put up something at the bottom of the screen here. Our job in managing this is not focusing on the blame. I'm just talking about ownership and accountability of managing a project. Okay. Um, I, I don't even want to talk about the COVID-19 because it, it can be detrimental to people. But the whole idea is that uh, if organizations close down due to some reasons, uh, most of the time people would blame internal or external factors. Uh, internal factors means I, I'm, I'm not a good general manager, I'm not a good CEO, uh, I did not do a good job and therefore my company collapses. Do people talk like that? Or do people say more like, uh, it's the weather, uh, it's the act of something, right? So, or some people even, they, they blame the government and then the sort of thing. So as I've said, our, our job here, we're not focusing on the blame, just looking at ownership and accountabilities, etc. Now let's see what we can do in terms of framework. Uh, the risk identification. Are we able to anticipate and identify risks? And the answer is this, look at all this list. Uh, let me just take one item at a time uh, to you know quickly work with you on that. Now, is it possible that your project run into a problem where people fall sick, they have attitude problem, their lack of skill, or they have taken emergency leave, or they resign? That's possible, right? And since it's possible, we put a tick here, we cannot use that as a reason for the project failure. So the idea that people can resign, they can, um, you know, they can come to work late, uh, they can take sick leave, they can take uh, emergency leave, they may even sabotage certain things, right? So all this shouldn't be a surprise. Okay, next, can things break down? Operational risks, equipment breakdown. You know? So as you run the operation, whatever job that you're doing, from a simple thing like, let's say your scanning machine, the office machine, computer breaks down, uh, you know, uh, server breaks down, full stack machine breaks down, et cetera, et cetera. So, Printers break down, so operational risk. To a more serious things like uh, the whole thing collapses, the equipment and so on. Not surprised. Reputational. The famous case, of course, is Tiger Wood and Nike. Uh, a number of years ago, Tiger Wood was uh, having affairs with uh, you know different women, and uh, what did Nike do? Terminate the contract, right? So because Nike is afraid that because of something, some action taken by someone. Uh, so we shouldn't pay sponsorship money. They don't want to be associated with bad reputation. And Singapore has enjoyed very, very good reputation. Uh, partly due to, you know, the, the, the things, you know, we've been familiar with the efficiencies and everything in place. Procedural risk. Um, so please don't comment about your current organizations. But have you seen organizations where just $50 or $100, you need 10 signatures? Uh, by the way, I'm exaggerating. Yeah? So, but you know the spirit of the procedural risk. This is red tape, bureaucratic, uh, takes a long time to make a decision and delay the, you know, the project and whatnot. Timeline. Uh, anything to do, do with, uh, as I said, delay your suppliers, your customers may change the timeline and affecting you. Financial risk, mainly cash flow, you're not able to manage your cash flow properly or your customers or your suppliers not managing it properly. Natural disaster, 
Uh, overall, in this part of the world, uh, I think Singapore and Malaysia are very blessed. Uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Taiwan, etc. Earthquake, volcanoes, whatnot, tsunami, you name it. So here's my point. If you are running a project, assuming that you are running a project, you got to depend on the importation of something from overseas. Let's say you've got to import something from Japan. And uh, the, as you know, the shipping road from Japan to Singapore, you got to pass through you know, those areas and suddenly the shipment got delayed due to typhoon in the Philippines. And by now, you probably know that we do not accept that as a surprise. We do not accept that. And the reason we don't accept that, if I just recalibrate, yeah? uh, the reason we don't accept that is not because we are interested in blaming. We are interested in understanding that adverse events can be anticipated, although not their timing. In this case, the timing, if you are talking about the exact hours and seconds and minutes that this happens. But overall picture, does Philippines have typhoon? Yes. Do they have season? Yes. Can they be predict predictable within the, the, the period? Yes. We just don't know exactly when. Uh, more or less, you can tell what day, you know, the landfall, you know, will, will reach certain places. And, and the shipment got delayed because of that. So we don't, we don't really take that. As, as a reason. And some of you, you have uh, been familiar with this. I've, I've talked about PEST before, P-E-S-T. So for those who are familiar, give me what's the P, if you are familiar. Thank you, Andy So P is this, political. E is economical. Uh, Rebecca, environmental is fine. And then the S is the social and technological, that's right. So those, uh, when you have the environmental factor, I would actually put it next to here, which is the fine as well. Some people put uh, the longer list like pastel, legal challenges and so on. So there are lots of things that we can actually do uh, in terms of managing this. Now, that's the first thing. Now, of course, when you attend the full day course, we will actually talk to you about the differences. What are we able to do in order to prevent some of these risks from happening? Because the natural step after the identification, the natural step is the managing or the mitigation part. It splits into two, one of which is prevention. Can we prevent? And the other two is if you can't prevent, can we mitigate? So for example, obviously you can't prevent typhoon from happening. Right? Are we able to mitigate? Uh, are we able to have plan B and plan C? And so on. And therefore, a good project manager would actually adopt this healthy practices and manage it from there. Okay, now, um, also to add on to that, uh, maybe I'll just challenge um, some of you. Can you stop people from resigning? The answer is no. Uh, can you ask people not to take emergency leave? No. So the trick is managing is that can you influence your boss or your clients or whoever? Can you pick the right kind of people? Okay. So the simplest example, I want to give you the simplest example is that if your location of project is in, if I could just point a place, let's say it's, it's, it's near Jurong East, if the location of projects near Jurong East. I got to two choices, two people to choose from. Uh, you choose one of the two. Uh, one of them is staying at, uh, say, Chochukang. The other one is staying at Pasir Ris. Which one would you choose? The one with Pasir Ris or uh, Chochukang? The answer is very obvious. All things being equal, I will choose the one that is actually nearer. Okay, so, and that's just an example of mitigation and, and managing all these risks. So that's the second step after we have done the first step, second step is risk identification. Okay. And we move on to this. 
how many of you think that everybody welcomes your project? If you, if you think that everybody is happy with whatever you're doing, please type one. You can use the example just now, improving productivity. So uh, if you are doing a project and the project is save cost or save time or improve productivity, uh, if you think that your colleagues love you, please put one. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, I, I'm not sure they will kind of fly a flag and say, welcome, welcome, you know, you know, come, come, let's, let's do some improvement. And the idea of this is improvements, things like uh, productivity, or if you use the word cost cutting, uh, it's even more scary, right? So I'm not sure they will actually welcome you in their department to do any project at all. So therefore, this particular segment of project management, uh, after understanding the title of the project, the risk, the next thing to do is to understand the idea of stakeholders. So what can people do to your project? Generally, they can do two things. They can either give you support or they can give you problem. Okay. So what I would like to do is that when they give you support, uh, example of support is in a case of project, they can maybe allow you to ask for uh, agree with you to get more resources for you. That's the support. And they can actually block you. They can give you problems. They can say something behind the back of the key stakeholders. So people can give you support or they can give you problem. And the next discipline, I use the word discipline uh, in a positive way. The first discipline or the first step is to make the title and the quantification. And the next discipline is have a habit of understanding risks. And the third discipline is pull people to your side so that you can actually get the support. Forget about project for the moment, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about this word. I'm going to type something on the screen here. Okay, I'm just... Uh, this one. Now, if you're looking at your own company system, uh, promotion system after the performance appraisal, right? Okay, so, and the idea is that, um, do you think your boss would talk to other people before he or she even considers your promotion? And the answer is most likely yes. So if your boss is talking to other people, and depends on what other people say. Yeah? So if I use, say if your boss is talking to other colleagues, and say, hey, uh, you guys, uh, what do you think about Andrew? Now, if most of them said something like this, boss, if you promote Andrew, you, you just, you're going to regret for the rest of your life. If everybody says that, I think your uh, promotion prospect has gone kaput. But if everybody says this, or almost everybody says this, uh, boss, if you promote Andrew, you will not regret for the rest of your life. Now, so that's giving support and giving problems in the same, in the same sense, right? Now, likewise, uh, in the project setting, you need to secure support from people and try to minimize or neutralize those people who are not supporting you. Okay, and that's the nature of the third discipline here, mainly managing the stakeholders. Okay, and uh, so there are many, many stakeholders. So I would like to challenge you, and you can type that in now, just a bit of space of time to think about that, right? Can a tea lady, assuming your office or your organization has a tea lady, right? Can a tea lady be your stakeholders? The auntie that, um, or maybe the housekeeping stuff. Okay. Can they be your uh, stakeholders? And the answer is yes, definitely. Okay, they are stakeholders. Um, and the, 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 the part about this is that uh, if the tea lady is a stakeholder, then we got to pay attention to them. Uh, they even including housekeeping stuff, you know, it's, it's a respectful job. Eh? So we don't look down upon people. Uh, they have conversations, right? Okay, so when you run the project, sometimes you shouldn't be surprised. 
some big bosses they talk to security guard <laughs> they talk they may even talk to housekeeping and so on yeah close to others that's right thank you Sihun and others so they, they they may interact with other people and they may become your supporter if you do a good job in managing stakeholders so remember we are not talking about the project yet huh? So managing stakeholders is an important discipline of that. Um, so there are lots of people who could be stakeholders. So, and the definition is this, whoever that could be impacted by your action. In this case, if you're doing a project, think about who could be impacted by you. And the word impact uh, could be, you, when you do your project, you may have to give more work or more burden to someone else. And in that case, they are your stakeholders. Or you could be helping them to improve their efficiency. That's also your stakeholders. So you've got to be very careful with the stakeholders. So what I wanted to do here is I would like to uh, look at the approaches and uh, before we get into something else. So how do you manage stakeholders? Two words. One of the word is rational approach. And this is the one that some of you type earlier about, you know, getting approval from your bosses uh, as long as you can justify, right? Um, so those are the example that you can actually secure bosses uh, support. So that is the rational approach. Uh, for instance, you you use you, you say that uh, we're going to do this and then we will save some time, we will save money, we will improve the organizational effectiveness, we will improve the team morale and so on and so forth. That's a rational approach. So I'm actually giving you a general answer. Um, the other group is this. Some people are not rational. Okay, and because of that, you got to use a different approach. So the first approach is this, the second approach is you got to use Sorry, this. So whether they like you or not is the element on the second approach. And therefore, if you are able or you plan to secure support for people, remember the, 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 kind, the, the, the point about this support stakeholders is that you want your project to be smooth sailing and you get into trouble like the risks, you want to secure more help. You may even have to ask for more time, more resources. And in order to do that, you need to secure help. That's basically what stakeholders is. So you, you got our job is that first we try number one, rational approach, right? An example, simple example, rational approach is we, we will need to spend $100,000 to do a project. But let me show you the data and a hundred thousand dollars. We're going to save how much? $2 million. That's rational approach. Um, no sane people would reject this kind of a project. Spend 10,000, spend hundred thousand, save 2 million. No one would reject that. That's a rational approach. However, my dear friends, not everyone is rational. Okay. So sometimes they use feelings to make decisions. Uh, if I could use me as an example, if, if I report to you, if I ask for project extension, I ask for more resources, uh, would you agree? Well, that depends on how you feel, right? So if every time you see my face, you vomit, would you? <laughs> Sorry, a bit, a, a bit gross. So hopefully this is, this is like you know, dinner time or approaching to buka posa time. So I hope I haven't spoiled your dinner. But the whole idea is that sometimes people make decisions based on feelings. Okay, so that is the whole idea of that. Uh, in the session in itself, for the full day session, we will work with you on how do we kind of manage the stakeholders, converting the negative to positive, or converting the negative to at least, if not positive, then neutral. They are not saying bad things behind you. Okay, so that's part of the, the thing. And the last bit about project, 
the, the, the other thing that I would like to show is just the tools and techniques which will cover a lot uh, using Gantt chart and critical path methodology. But before we get into those things, maybe I'll just throw some terminologies and we'll see how it works, especially for those who are uh, new in this area of project management. So we have lots of tools to use Gantt chart, critical path method, and uh, you know, PERT, P-E-R-T, lots of lots of others. Now, uh, in managing project, what you do is when you look at the screen, yeah, we will urge you to forget about the dictionary for a short moment in time. So if you are new to this, what is the meaning of the word critical path? What is the meaning of non-critical path in project management? So uh, not to be confused with the normal English word, we should momentarily say goodbye to those words huh? because non-critical sounds like it's not important, right? So everything is important. Every task is important. The only difference is that what tasks are critical and what tasks are non-critical. And the definition of critical is very simple in project management. Critical means you cannot afford to delay. If you delay, the whole project will be delayed. Non-critical, you can delay subject to a limit. Okay, so you have a bit of leeway, you have a bit of flexibility if it is non-critical. Okay, so we're not to be confused with parallel or sequential tasks, right? So sequential task is I, I got to do A first before I do B. Parallel means A and B can run concurrently together, right? Um, and this is not to be confused with those parallel or sequential. So critical means you can't delay. Let's do a quick one. So the screen that you see here, um, let me just put something simple. There are two paths. This is one path. This is another one. This is the shared, the common path, right? So when you do the project, this is a very simple three activities. So this is the first task, the second task, the third, three tasks or three activities. So, and um, so, and just to, just put this in, uh, out of this, between this one and two, which one of these is critical and which one of these is non-critical? So if you could just type your answer, that'd be very helpful. Just a, a quick uh, interaction as well. So you're almost, uh, it's been a long day maybe to some of you. <laughs> okay. I remember the definition, uh, critical means you can't afford to delay. Uh, which means you can delay this one, okay? You can delay this, but you cannot delay this. Because if you delay this, your project is supposed to take three weeks. Huh? This is one week, this is another week. If you delay this, it's gonna be more than three weeks already. Okay, and therefore, this item number two here is critical, you cannot delay. And this, I put a tick, you can delay. Okay, this one you can delay. And delay for how long? The difference between these two. All right, two weeks and one day. So this is what I meant earlier, you can or you can't delay. And therefore, when you manage projects, uh, then we will have a little bit of flexibility now. And um, so, and if you want to answer the question, we combine this risk management. So remember just now we talk about risk, right? You are hoping that the risk actually falls onto the non-critical part. This one, this is non-critical. So if you have risk, you know, from the PEST to human into many, many other kinds of risks, the whole thing is that you hope that it actually happens on the non-critical part. That's how we actually manage a project. That distinguishes between a very good successful project managers and those who are not so successful. Um, which part is critical? There are two, these two. Okay. And there are two identical timing here. 
and this is actually non-critical. So I just want to check in with you. Uh, so this is critical, this is critical, and this is non-critical because you can delay the non-critical. Right. So that's as simple as I can put it to be. Which part is critical? So when you have all that, then you're able to relate risk to all this critical part already. So we have this project. What happened you happen to complete it sooner? You know, someone asked you to do it faster. And uh, the whole thing about that is you, first of all, please, when you plan for the project, please remember to include risk into your project as we have stated earlier. Uh, if you need to, if you need time, uh, if I use the example that we have just now, if you are importing something from Japan, you know that there's a typhoon season in the Philippines, some, you know, along certain months, then you got to plan that project in, or alternatively, you got to plan to import it from another source, which doesn't have to pass through the Philippines, the Taiwan uh, seaboard, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if you have that, then you can incorporate that. Um, so hopefully the risk is happening on the non-critical. Remember, non-critical, you can delay. Now, finally, failing which, unfortunately, your risk falls onto the critical part. Your original project duration of nine months or four months or 12 weeks, whatever it is, is non-doable anymore. And you can try your best you can ask for help from stakeholders. That's how we actually uh, do that. Okay, so, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, that we have some time for question now, by the way, a few minutes. If you have any questions or clarifications, uh, that would be fantastic. So remember, this is a kind of a sneak preview of what project management would entail and uh, in, the, in the session itself, we will be doing breakout rooms uh, depending on the number of packs. Uh, we get us to actually run through this and help us. Okay. And so we have allocated about approximately one hour. Uh, if you have questions, you, if you haven't thought about it, that's fine. You can uh, still send emails to Adventist Learning School and they can, maybe they can actually you know, direct the email to me. I can actually address that. Okay. Uh, this is about Adventist award-winning uh, organizations, you know, recently, last year and the year before, and there are lots of lots of seminars. You can learn lots of lots of wonderful trainers. Um, some trainers, they do different topics and uh, some they do uh, other topics as well. Uh, just to remind you, as I've shared earlier on the screen here, uh, we have a, a session on June 5th, so if you can, you can attend this and there's a, you scan the QR code, you can take a screenshot. Uh, there's a, I believe there's a 20% discount from Adventist, it's very kind enough. So you can get in touch with the person on the screen. Her name is Chai Fun, and there's an email or the number. So you can take a screenshot on that. And uh, so I hope to be able to see you on that day. And uh, so if not, some other occasions. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time. Have a very, very good day and be safe. Cheers.